So the, qu the question for this is, uh, how can open source help to build a, a sustainable world? And it's, we've sort of looked in the past about economic and environmental issues. We are now realizing there's perhaps a, a biological issue that none of us had thought about prior to about eight weeks ago. Um, how can SMEs and organizations more generally leverage the skills future initiatives here? And how can open source build uh, sustainable solutions? I think it's, it's an evidence-based uh, discipline and, and to discovery of fundamental phenomena and principles and how things work. And, and building on that discovery, that kind of knowledge, we can then translate into technology that can help solve problems. So many of the things that we enjoy now, we have to say because of science. So science is inherently important to us. Science is inher inherently uh, a driving force in our civilization. And, and, and the part about uh, uh, how science uh, can come in, I mean, from the Science Centre perspective, we've been shouting this slogan, especially about, among our young people, that uh, may, the, may the power of STEM be with you. We want to empower our young people to understand the importance of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and maths. And in recent time, we are also putting on this notion of STEM plus. STEM must plus something else, values, ethics, accountability, integrity, all these are important things that we should bring in. And STEM is now moving closer and closer to integrate with social sciences, philosophy, and thinking. Uh, and, and we have to start from young. Uh, uh, and Science Center is really putting in a lot of effort to, to want to raise the awareness, appreciation, to empower our young people to know how to use STEM for sustainable development, for the goodness of the world. And uh, that's the reason why uh, Science Center, when we were introduced to Force Asia, we, were, we have been a strong supporter behind all this. And early on, we saw Mario very emotional, I mean, talking about how uh, open source is a way to help to make so-called some of the inaccessible science and technology discovery and IP especially. Uh, I know I came from a university, usually, oh, you must protect it, you, know, must, you must make the IP uh, a money-making machine. But now the world is telling us that that's not the only way of moving forward. And sometimes science and technology need to be shared in an open way so that we can actually help the world move on like the crisis we face now. Um, so, yes, Science Centre, I identify with that, e that ethos. There's, there's certainly that is important. There's certainly a, uh, an apparent parallel that uh, scientists have known for centuries, since the beginning of of learning journals about the importance of, not even the importance, uh, but, but the, the fact that if you have not published what it is you say you, you've discovered and how and what your evidence is and how you obtained that evidence, where not only can it be reviewed before it's published, but where other scientists can reproduce it or find holes in it to make their own reputations, yes. then science wouldn't proceed. Yes. But for four centuries, that's how science, three centuries, yes. how yes. science has proceeded. Yes. So if we're did not. It was purely a commercial uh, tool, and its open source in the last two decades has drastically changed that. And it's almost the same idea. It says, okay, if you're making software, it's, you use it for the thing you're using it for, but actually it then needs to be in the hands of others rather than everybody starting from scratch. So it's, yeah, it, the parallel is interesting. I'm, I'm, not, I'm always conscious of time, otherwise we'd sit here for hours. Um, so, that's why you've been previously, you're not no longer, right? The The sort of driver here at LLI. Um, I don't even know how to pronounce the name of the company we are now CEO. Is that Origin? It is Origin. Uh, for the benefit of the audience, the G has been replaced with a nine. <laughs> or a nine in, but okay, Origin. Very funky. <laughs> <laughs> the name has been folded. It's origami, yes, very good. Um, addressing skills gaps in lifelong learning. Uh, lifelong education is seen as a central success factor for society. Uh, and it's great to see this in, in, in Singapore. What impact could you observe or have you observed about programs and initiatives for lifelong learning in recent years? What, what stands out? Thanks, thanks, Lauren. Um, from my perspective, uh, I used to be in SkillFuture and had been started my career uh, after my MOE stint uh, in Workforce Development Agency. So from that aspect, uh, the past 14 years I've been working uh, on workforce development as well as lifelong learning. So in this uh, perspective, I think uh, related to the question, I think lifelong learning, as we all would agree, uh, is increasingly, if not uh, uh, 
more important than ever. The fact that uh, continuing education is something that uh, we all should uh, continue to aspire and, and, and to, 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 to develop ourselves. So from, from that aspect, uh, in terms of the program that uh, the past years, we could have seen some progress, or at least from the government perspective. I think Skill Future uh, initiative is one which we could probably take the opportunity to also elaborate. The fact that the government in Singapore has been uh, very proactively trying to put in place a system, a national effort, and a national movement to ensure, or at least to encourage uh, every individual citizens and permanent residents to really adopt this um, lifelong learning mindset. In fact, lifelong learning is not new. In fact, it's been uh, around since uh, we can remember. Uh, the fact that uh, even as a nation, in fact, lifelong learning, nation building is based on lifelong learning. If I may just, uh, in the, if you may just indulge me, I can kind of give you a bit of a brief history about Singapore. Since independence uh, uh, till today, we actually have been really adopting what lifelong learning is about, from learning uh, to survive in the early days when we got our independence in the 60s, all the way to early 70s. And then we've, we actually go on to the next phase of learning to uh, stay ahead. As a, as a nation, as a country, a small country, we have no natural resources. Obviously, the human capital, human resources are the only resource that we have. And if we don't capitalize on it and to ensure that workforce development is in place and every individual is a talent by their own rights and how they can be developed and harnessed in terms of their very best, then as a country, we will be doomed, so to speak. And henceforth, from that on, we find that uh, we move on to learning to stay ahead, to learning to compete. Because as we learned about the tricks of things and we learned about how we can survive and how to stay ahead, next is naturally learn to compete among the, the neighboring countries and even at the global stand. Henceforth, we can see that uh, in the next phase in the 80s to the 90s, we also go into the phase we call learning for life. And today, uh, at the latest phase, which is skill future, this is learning for a new world. Obviously, through these various phases of learning as a nation, we actually kind of progress from a low skill, low wage country to now, to date, as one of the developed country where we are adopting uh, innovation-based uh, economy. And obviously trying to also stay to survive in the Industrial Revolution 4.0. So to cut, uh, yeah, to, to, to kind of address the, 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 the question, is that then how this program actually help? Actually from, from the perspective of a, a nation, you find that uh, it works only because there is close collaboration between the government and the private sector. And if the, this collaboration is not strong, you find that there is always this issue about you know policies not being disseminated right mm -hmm. down uh, very clearly to the man in the street, and obviously at the company level you can see that if the bosses or if the uh, employers are not advocates of lifelong learning, then the staff in a way will not be able to really harness their potential and to learn what they need to learn to be uh, upskill and reskill so that they can cope with the uncertainty in the economy. And right down to even community, if you can see there are successes in, in Singapore in the sense that the communities are working together with the Communi Community Development Council. Every region, every district are, if you can see, there are learning opportunities where people work together with the businesses, the education institutes, as well as the individual residents in a particular constituency. So these are just some success stories as I could see, that how as a nation we can push this lifelong learning. So I have a, a, a sort of broader context question. Um, and this is, I actually don't know this because I've obviously I've lived in Singapore for a decade, but there certainly was a, a cultural norm growing up in Australia yes. that education was a thing you did in your sort of childhood, your teens and your early adulthood. And then once you had whatever level of sort of bachelor's or master's, perhaps doctorate that you pursued, unless you were studying in academia, you kind of sort of stopped at that point and then went and did something real with the continuing professional education obligations that, that members of professional societies have. That's fine, but, the, but the, even those are fairly, fairly modest. Um, is there a change in Singapore in the, in the mentality? Has that mentality existed in the past and is it now a need to teach people, not just that Singapore as a society has to learn, but that, that individual Singaporeans have to switch from I educated my childhood, teens and, and early adulthood to it's a 
solid engagement throughout my life to learn new skills and new approaches. Yes, of course, that's the change. In fact, they were also saying that uh, uh, because of this, uh, especially in IR 4.0, where you know disruptive uh, technology, things are just—I mean, new things are popping up and so on, right? So, if uh, if you get a degree, I think you can settle down in a career and then for life. That's that's going to be a miss now. Good luck. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Harish, I have an entire suite of things I could ask you. Um, but I. Look, one of my own areas of concern is at the top of my list here. Uh, how can open source help um, make the world more ecologically sustainable? What are, what are the things that open source communities and organizations can do? Well, I mean, you know, you, you, the answer is obvious. I mean, if you don't do open, we have a huge problem, and we have seen it already. Um, defaulting to open across the board, I mean, it doesn't matter what it is, whether it is uh, uh, science, research work, publications, uh, people learning about stuff, teaching one another. The content is open. The more people get it, the better it becomes. I mean, it, we have seen it empirically. It's not a wishful thinking in that sense. So we know that works. And this event itself, in many ways, everything that we are doing here, a lot of it is built on open technologies of one form or shape or manner. So having said that, I think the, the, the question that you're trying to probably ask is about how do we sustain it? I, it's, yeah. There's a bunch of connected questions, but yes, that's yeah, something. It's, it's sustainable. Economically, how do we sustain it? The sure. only way we can sustain it is by educating, by getting people to understand what is available, what is out there, talk about different ideas. And, and the challenge that I think uh, Jinming has uh, in, in the university is uh, you know, the notion that I have to protect my ideas. Otherwise, uh, how do I monetize it uh, aspect? which is going down a path which is actually, uh, sadly, that's not really the... Uh, a fully thought through process. What, what do I mean by not fully th thought through is because none of those researchers and re uh, people in the university are the ones who potentially may be turning it into a commercial operation. They are not the ones. They will depend on somebody else to do the job for them. In the meantime, between them creating whatever that was created and they hide it, and they keep it to themselves, and it goes out in the industry, the lag period is indeterminate. We have no idea if it ever goes out there. So if I use that as the starting point, so when I talk to uh, organizations and a lot of startups that I help consult with as well from an open perspective, right, they say, oh, we, we have uh, uh, stuff that our VCs have asked us to patent, to protect from an IP perspective, blah, blah, blah. We don't want to share ideas. We want to keep right. it for ourselves and so on. So in the end, I, my question to them would be, so, you are a, so this is a startup scenario. A startup, you create stuff and you want to patent it, you're going to spend a lot of money. The people who end up getting the money would probably be the lawyers. <laughs> and assuming... Oh, yeah, yeah, like an international patent is forty, <laughs> sixty thousand $60,000 goes to yeah. lawyers. It's a lot of so money. So they are the ones going to get the money. While, while you may have gotten a piece of paper saying that this has got a patent and it's got X number of years or whatever, what are you going to do with it? Oh, we're going to keep it. Or are you, my question then, are you going to actively license it to somebody else? Oh, we haven't thought through that yet. Yeah, because yeah, the, <laughs> the unstated business model is it's all going to get piled up it's in a piled holding up. company yeah. for troll. And just wasted a lot of money, so you're not openly sharing with it. Yeah. So the, 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 the startups that I help uh, explain to them, I say, why don't you just go ahead and open it up? And the point about it is not about holding it back. It's by if your ideas are in you and you don't execute on it, yeah. it's useless. Yeah. You may have the best idea in the world. Agreed. Execute. They say, oh, I cannot present this at this event. I cannot present yeah. it in the universe. I cannot write it in the paper because somebody's going to steal my idea. If the person stole your idea and executed on it, kudos to him or her. By you not sharing it, you, ha you, have, you couldn't execute. So you failed it. And so that's really what uh, But And that's also the, the broader problem that getting a thing out into the world costs resources, which yeah. generally means you've either got to have enormous grants from somewhere yeah. or you've got to build a business. And in practice... The execution on those two things is usually the, the more uncertain That's right. task. And so the idea of, I've got an idea and it's valuable, well, not until it's... So yeah, I, I've seen that it, enough. It's, it's, it's a toss-up because if you are not... If you don't get... It, it seems to be an aha moment that happens with people about sharing. It is when you share it for whatever it is that you share and then you benefit from it somehow 
not directly. That's sometimes where you say, oh, that was good that I did that. It takes some time for that because as, 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 a, as, a, as a species, we share a lot of things. We grew up sharing things. That's how we've always been. Somewhere in that system, the, the sharing stopped. And that became a problem. But why was it stopped and why, what was the motivation for the stop was, is kind of forgotten in, in the midst of... Yeah, and, and more is better. Yeah. Well, I'm reasonably certain that patent trolls are responsible for a lot of this, not directly, but because their existence creates an aftermarket for patents. So I've spoken to investors who are very, very keen uh, to have the patents because that gives them a thing that remains if the business fails. And you, know, you only have to think a very short period to realize what the value in that is, the only value that has. So this is an investor's perspective is, if I put in you know, 10 million bucks into building this business and it collapses, then I walk away with nothing. But if patents were secured, then I've got a thing that's valuable. Why is it valuable? Because I can sell it to someone for, for money. What, who can you sell it to for money? A troll. The only people who buy generic patents who but don't... But that's where the problem comes in. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. But the, yeah. So the, it's not just this... This is a bit like the arguments about copyrights and music. It's not, in fact, about benefiting the creators. Sorry, I'm becoming a panel a member rather than a host. But it, it's actually often this secondary market that, that no one thinks about that is changing the behaviour of investors, not for their own benefit, be, but because they want something to, to monetize if the business fails. And that distorts all the behaviour of the... So yeah, it's, it's a sorry. It's an area it, I it, it is. A, it is a real sustainability. That is some area aspect of sustainability that doesn't feed back positively into the rest yeah. of the ecosystem. <laughs> it's, it's That's really what anti-sustainability. It yeah, it, it's actually a negative uh, uh, thing into the system. Let me uh, invite audience members like these three rather interesting gentlemen here. Do, <laughs> do any of you have questions you'd like to pose in this sort of broad area about how? We use openness, free and open source software in particular, but openness generally, and the the access of it, access to it in an educational setting, to address questions of sustainability. Is this no? Okay. Awesome. Maybe if I were to pose a question. Sorry. Oh dear! I, apparently, I have an urgent message. Oh, a question! I see. Yes, because we have people remote. God. It's like we have all this technology that's in open source and we have forgotten to use it. <laughs> to work out which phone has it. <laughs> <laughs> Too much technology sometimes. Right. So. <laughs> Roll into it. Here we go. Question. Could, could the Singapore government open source the government code, especially when it was done using public funds? But this is not a crazy question. This comes up a lot. Um, I think actually that one I might start with Harish. This seems very close to your... Yeah, it, it is close to my heart. Uh, I can't speak for the government, and I don't know whether you, mean you can speak for government, but as a citizen, as a tax-paying citizen, I want the code that government writes that is built using taxpayer money to be open sourced. Very simple. All of it? Sorry? All of it? All of it. Subject to national requ uh, security requirements. So I, d I don't want necessarily to say, oh, everything the Ministry of Defense does or Defense Science Technology Agency does or any of the defense or security related stuff necessarily to be opened up. But anything that is done from a public perspective, for example, uh, parking.sg as a, as a, as a, it's a, it's an app that allows you to uh, pay your parking uh, fees wherever you park in Singapore. Great, open it up. Let me add some stuff to it. I don't know what I want to add, but maybe I can, maybe I can't, but maybe I can check. I don't know what it is, but do it. It's easy to do. After all, it was built using open source tools. At, at least one of LTAs was the, the on-demand bus uh, request. I, I don't recall. I know okay. there was some something. Right. But again, it's got to do with, I, as a taxpayer, as a citizen, I think we should. Because it is our money that went into it. However, uh, you know, I, I can only speak as a, an individual. Uh, and naturally, I'm biased. 
because of what I believe in, and I think this makes a lot more sense. However, I pass it on to yeah, Jin yeah. to say what he <laughs> wants to say. Well, uh, I, I'm not speaking on behalf of government, uh, but I, I came from university and I understand the discussion, uh, the protection of IP and the value of a patent and so on. And with regards to this perspective of uh, whether whatever that is funded by the government should be given out for open use and so on, um, I think there, there's a fine line to, to, to draw, right? Because somebody got to pay for this development and some development costs a lot of money. Um, so I guess there, there should be some kind of value to say uh, how much is in there and who is paying for it. And how can you, in a way, balance the, uh, at the Science Centre, we always talk about how do you balance doing good and doing well? Doing good means you do for the goodness of the larger community. But you must do well because you must be able to bring in money to sustain your doing good. If you continue to do good but you don't do well, very quickly you run out of money, you run out of resources, you can't even develop new technology. So how do you balance that? So but is, right? is this about uh, perceived additional costs involved in making source code open or is this about giving up the opportunity to commercially exploit something? It, it's, it's both. Okay. It's both. Because to, to sustain that creativity, that innovation, you need investment and somebody's got to pay for it and if the product turned out to be something that can benefit everybody but there's no return one way or another so so the, the next question will be then how do you measure the return is the return in terms of dollars and cents or is, or is the return in terms of the wellness and the sustainability of the ecosystem so that you don't have to go and do damage control so if let's say the return is everybody's very happy Right. And, uh, so, so you don't have to, you can't buy happiness, right? Money social, cannot decide. Strong happy. social capital, I believe, so, so is how the do you, current term. How do you put a value to the innovation that justified that huge sum of money coming in? Right. So that's one aspect. Another aspect is, would somebody then use your, your technology and they are clever enough to twist it around to make it something that you have to pay for them to sell you back? <laughs> I think that is another equation. That's, that's right. exactly where we turn the opportunity into how you make it available, the licensing model, the open source licensing model. So, you know, what we can do, like, for example, I mean, I just cite a very simple example that happened a few years ago where the Prime Minister, he wrote a, a bit of code, uh, I believe it was in, in Python, if I'm wrong, not wrong, on how to uh, play uh, Sudoku. Sudoku. PM's and, version yeah, was in C++. And, yeah, for his wife. And he published a code. So when, when he published the code, I saw it and I said, firstly, there are a few issues with the code, okay? Because he didn't put a license statement on it. I said, please put a license statement. How am I supposed to share this? How, how am I supposed to use it? How am I supposed to fix it if I want to fix it? Uh, eventually, he did publish, uh, and I put it onto, uh, he didn't put it onto any specific uh, uh, repository. So I put it on my repository and make it a public site and uh, his email response to me as part of the repo as well to say, okay, this is the Prime Minister's code, this is the code, and then he said this is on an MIT license. Fine. So the point about it is we need people at government level, at the highest possible level, to understand some of these things because at the end of the day, it's about licensing. When you create something, as you just mentioned, that what if someone takes whatever we have, we have all cre collectively created and then it turns it into a, pro uh, a, a solution. Now, it costs me a lot of money to even use it and then they close it up. Yeah. Well, the starting point is what is the license that you, that you put your, whatever your creations on in the first place. Yeah. Uh, I personally, you know, I'm biased towards uh, a, 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 a GPL type of license because you cannot close it up, end of story. Any other license is not necessarily in my favor in the long term. It is in favor of whoever expands on it and then you know, closes up parts, parts of it, which is, yeah, it's still open, but it's not. Uh, so that is an argument and discussion that we have to have at government level. So in other words, the code put out by government. But it's also project by project. Different projects have different economics and different different. Yeah, because the starting concerns. point is different. I agree. Yeah. But the thing is, anything that... I mean, going back to what you just said, there, there's a cost involved in creating it. Agreed. But the cost was from where? From tax dollars. So it's your tax money, my tax money, and people around this room tax dollars to pay for that. Not something else. So I don't, I don't what do you pay for it? So not for an example, uh, all of NASA's uh, yeah. imagery and, and mission data, not all mission data, but certainly the imagery collected during the Apollo program, 
all of it is in the public domain. Yeah, but more than that, everything that NASA does, for that matter, is in public domain. Turns out the there may be some portions <laughs> of it. Special values of the word everything. But, but, yeah, but, but, but the overwhelming majority, yeah, yes. Overwhelming, because yeah. it's for the greater good. And from their point of view, it's, it's more than the United States. It's, it benefits all of us in many ways. I mean, GPS is another example of it. Yeah, you know, uh, we, we can use the data for free. No issues there. But the point of, I'm trying to make is that uh, opening it up because of the source of funding to create it in the first instance is my argument. By opening it up, how are you making it available? We, don't, we shouldn't be in the business of, we as in, in this case, uh, government for example, should not be in the business of trying to create a license for whatever. Use what is already done. It's already been thought through, there's enough experience with people, the legal community has been switched on to, to, a, to an extent that, is, that they, they can understand some of the nuances. There, there are also just significant internal costs. So look at things like one map. Uh, which continues to persist in using the, the Nokia engine at enormous cost. Yeah. And the reasoning is, oh, that way we get to keep everything secret because that way we can make money. That, wait, what? <laughs> it's that way you can give money to Nokia. I don't, this doesn't seem like it makes any sense. But talking to a group who implements stuff for one map for multiple government bodies on a contract basis, they are pushing for OpenStreetMap. And the response is always this whole, oh, no, we have to protect it. It's like, you're just protecting your ability to give money to Nokia. <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to beat up Nokia. You're just protecting to your ability to, to have to then go and buy a really costly uh, commercial tool. So it's, the, it's, not even, it's not even that you should argue about where to draw the line. This is an example where, so far as I can tell, the a things are turned on its head. A lot of times I've noticed that the aha moment happens, like in that scenario, w could happen when Nokia disappears. Yeah, okay. At which point, oh, what do I do? I'm stuck. I can't fix this. I can't update yeah. this. I can't do whatever it is that I need to do. That's the other. It's a, it's yeah, a that's hedge when, against... Oh, oh yeah. I'm stuck. There's nothing new happening. It, it's, it's, it's the mother of all hedges against supply chain risk. It's <laughs> like you don't have any. That is brilliant. Is this an area that you would like to weigh in on? Uh, yeah, perhaps from, from the, my own personal perspective is that uh, I may be wrong because the open source community, I mean, the awareness of the use of open source, perhaps in Singapore, is not as strong as in elsewhere. And henceforth, I thought one idea is that uh, if uh, practitioners or open source uh, uh, subject matter experts can actively uh, profile their contribution or maybe tap on existing uh, government funding in terms of like innovative fund, where Institute for Allowed Learning always uh, every quarter or half a year have this invitation to get people to come and provide solutions, learning solutions, for example. And they can actually come together and create an open source solution, perhaps. Right. And that can offer to the companies out there. And then they give something like 200000 as a as a development fund. So I, I suppose there's also the awareness of what can you tap on in terms of the schemes the government already put in place. Uh, likewise, uh, even encouraging SME to go internalization, uh, internationalization. Uh, obviously, there are also SME and startups uh, trying to leverage on some of the funds to produce, produce solutions for, for any particular industry needs. And that could also be an avenue for uh, people to explore using open source solution rather than the, you know, the, the more traditional. That, that, I suspect, is probably going to be a more bottom-up thing as it was in yeah. corporate America 20 years I think, ago. I think if, uh, for yeah. example, even when I was in Lifelong Learning Institute, we have a, a, a fund we call Encourage Learn SG Seed Fund. Of course, that cannot monetize, mon monetize your product, but essentially is to encourage others to, to know about what's open source, what are the magic that you can generate, and ideas like what uh, Mario has mentioned. You can start to proliferate this so that more and more people can come together and with a common consciousness, the government may take notice that actually there are a lot of potential in open source and they can actually help these people who are passionate about this area to really do something. At this point in time, I suspect I may be wrong that uh, they do not see that that that, that active, uh, you know, kind of pr promulgation of the idea of open source and how it can help SMEs who are fund stranded and so on. And now government cannot really help everything, but if there are people who actively create open source solution and yeah. SME can use it almost for free, <coughs> if not for a low cost, yeah. I'm sure there will be traction there as well. Yeah. Places to improve. Um, we've got about eight minutes left. Questions? Anyone? None?
Sorry, a question only, please. I'm not. <laughs> I can only have three panelists. <laughs> Is, so is it appropriate, is it feasible to put open source tools and systems in the hands of students when they're learning about tech? Uh, so I think this is, I think this is, let's start with Ted Meng. Well, I mean, <laughs> uh, certainly open source can be, and I think it is open to, to students who, who can appreciate and understand uh, how to use them. So that, that's back to where we say we need to start young to empower them and let them understand and open to this open source, so-called. And I also want to build on what uh, Tatsuan say. Uh, sometimes the, it's a communication, it's, uh, it's the understanding. If we could uh, let more people understand what open source is all about, and uh, in a way also show that young people can also understand, it's, it's not about how old and how smart you are. It's a matter of understanding how to use it. You empower them to go in there and open up their mind, open up their world, open up their applications. And then back to the point a little bit, because we need to talk about the business model that uh, whether you protect or not. Uh, I also want to build on what Taswan said. Probably the, the open source community should also educate the larger community because uh, there's this fear that, yeah, you want me to open to you, but you're keeping something in secret, right? I, I let you know, I even contribute in open source, but you are the one monetizing it without me knowing, right? But so that could be also that. Mistrust, so-called. Right? I think the starting point for that, I'd suggest, and this whole discussion by itself, is this, um, one of the major areas where open source has been successful is all of the plumbing for in any given technological artifact. There's a bunch of stuff that has to work technically, but in, at least in a commercial setting, does not affect the decision of customers to buy. Yeah. And often this is the overwhelming in software, the overwhelming majority of the software is in this category. And in that environment, the not invented here syndrome is, is really harmful. <laughs> and so it's that, if nothing else, cooperate in that space. And this is what I meant by bottom up. I think you'll find it's already happening. It was, 20 years ago, it was happening in corporate America that you know, Bill Gates was saying, no customer has ever asked me about Linux. And then it became apparent that every single Fortune 500 company, this is the same year, was using Linux in some mission critical role. At which point the world just went, ooh, <laughs> wait, and the 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 mind shift occurred. It occurred very quickly, but it was that was actually more a grounds up thing, a bottom up thing. That engineers getting a job done were just picking up open source components yep. to get it done, and of course feeding back fixes because it just makes their their life easier. So that is a sort of strategy for getting it in uh, it happens by itself and is working. But the this higher level, uh, yeah, how to address the hey, are you cheating me? Am I missing something? <laughs> How are you profiting? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a real one. I think that is a very a valid, extremely valid constraint uh, and concern as well. I, 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 let me, I'm not going to toot the horn for Red Hat, but I work with Red Hat, but I'm not pitching that in any sense. But there are some learnings and lessons that I'm more than happy to share. Everything that Red Hat does, it, it's, it's all open source stuff. We work upstream. We call it upstream. We work upstream. Yeah. Every single product that we ship there is an open source project and an open source product. A product is what we ship to our customers. Yeah. The product is based on an open source project. Yeah. And it is a two-way street. Yeah. Things that happen in the project goes into the product. Improvements in the product goes back to the project. Yeah. So it's a two-way street. And the key message there is that we work upstream. We want to make sure that the project is successful. And then we do what we need to do to make it work for the customer. Yeah. But in doing that, we are part we are, we are opening up everything to say, hey, look, uh, Mr. Project, this is what we're doing with the project. This yeah. is how we're fixing it. This is how we're doing whatever we're doing. And we tell the customer, this is coming from the open source project, but we are accountable to you. This way, you can come to us for any kind of liability. We, our neck is on the line for that. Yeah. And that's why you pay us for that. Right. And so this way, it, it is a very transparent model. And I, I, feel, I feel very... Uh, happy to be in that kind of a space because yeah. it 
resonates with my own personal ethos as yeah. well. I'm not screwing the customer in a, right. in, a, in a bad way. I'm not doing bad things to the, to the community. Right. I'm trying to make sure everybody succeeds. So it's win, win, win everywhere. So that's really what we need to do. Right. There will always be somebody who's going to say, oh, you're hiding something. Please tell me where I'm hiding, <laughs> what am I hiding? <laughs> Please show it to me. <laughs> then I'll try and unhide it. Right. We haven't. So that's really the, the message there. But again, it's not an easy thing to do. We magic. stumbled upon it yeah. by magic. You know? yeah. Oh, that's how we can do it. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's applicable. Pull out of the red hat. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it was one of those things that happened. Uh, well, actually, that's one. You pull the business model out of a hat, yeah. a red hat. But it does. <laughs> that is indeed what happened, right? So it, it happened in 2001 when 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 the when the dot com happened, uh, dot com boom and bust happened. It's like, how, how do we money? make money? Yeah. So yeah. trying to figure out. So this is what happened. Uh, we've, yeah. we've got a wrap. As ever, panels go fast too fast. I hope this has been interesting. Uh, may I have a round of thanks for my panelists.